uh, the liturgy today reminded me we were praying this um, this office together here in the uh, in the living room a few years ago uh, with a brother named Tony who lived with us, and we uh, we finished up the prayer, and he said, uh, "What was the name of that guy again? You quoted?" And I said it was Cesar Chavez, and he said, "Oh yeah, I remember when he came to the fields out in Delano." <laughs> 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 Just kind of, you know, they, they, these folks have been around us and i was thinking about how uh you know we remember when we think about hospitality dorothy day and her witness and i thought maybe we could start by just asking you robert to um share with us your memories of how you got to know dorothy day and the hospitality house there in new york well that was uh 1975 i was uh, a youngster 19 and I had uh, decided to take some time off from college and I went down there. I only expected to stay for uh, a few weeks, but you know how things are and uh, stretched on to five years. Mm. Uh, so I guess it was really not, you know, I didn't know much about Catholicism. I wasn't a Catholic. It was really the, uh, you mentioned uh, Cesar Chavez. It was, I think the picture of Dorothy Day being uh, arrested with the farm workers in 1973. There's a famous photograph by Bob Fitch that shows her uh, sitting uh, like Buddha sort of peacefully on this folding little uh, stool. And these, you just, you don't see the, the whole bodies, but just the, the kind of these burly uh, profiles of these uh, police with guns and clubs, you know, and just this contrast between her uh, tranquility and the strength, though, uh, you know, that was more powerful than, 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 than weapons, just the witness mm -hmm. of the truth and of love. And she was, uh, she was a, a, a great, uh, uh, you know, a follower, or a disciple, or what a friend, an ally of Cesar Chavez all the way from the beginning. Uh, she really uh, appreciated the, the, the farm work. The Catholic worker, of course, was started in the 1930s, and there was a lot of emphasis on the labor struggle. Uh, May 1st, as you, you mentioned, was the uh, inaugural date for the Catholic worker. But she really appreciated the farm workers because she felt that it was not just fighting for uh, working conditions and, and uh, better pay and that sort of thing, but was a, a kind of a social movement uh, mm -hmm. that pointed toward uh, the dignity of work and the importance of community and was rooted very much in a kind of Gandhian spirit of nonviolence. Uh, but, you know, Chavez is also a very devout Catholic and employing a lot of uh, symbols and icons, Our Lady of Guadalupe and uh, fasting and pilgrimages. And there was a kind of uh, spiritual dimension to that. So that was uh, what really drew me to the Catholic worker. And mm. it took a long time for me to kind of get a larger picture of really what it was all about. Mm. So good. Uh, I want to bring in DL here uh, because what were you doing in 1975? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but I love this because it's kind of this intergenerational conversation about uh, someone that's so important to us and to our history as a country and world. I mean, so how did you first start leaning in and learning about Dorothy Day since you weren't quite rocking it back in 1975? Yeah, yeah, I, I was born a few years after Dorothy Day died, and so I, I came to her actually through, I think it was one of your events, Shane, there was like a button you put out that said, if you have two coats, you have stolen one from the poor. Do you remember putting out those oh, yeah. buttons? Yeah, so I, I saw remember that, that button. button maker y'all had. <laughs> we still got that thing, you kidding me? Yeah. Yeah, so I got that button, and I just loved it. And I felt really great because at that time I only had one coat, so I felt pretty good about myself. And I just, you know, started living in community with recently arrived refugees in my city. And growing up uh, white evangelical, I had this framework of I go and I help people, right? And then when I finally saw like, oh, here's this lady who, who has something to say about poverty. I read her book, The Long Loneliness. And what it did is it just really knocked my socks off because she was basically saying, I went to the poor and the marginalized and the dispossessed in, in my country of the United States, and I found Christ there. Mm. And that's the exact opposite. I was being taught at my Bible college to be a missionary, to bring Jesus with me, to bring all the right answers. And I was trying that, and it was failing miserably. And instead, I was being invited into these places of hospitality, these communities of struggle. And I was experiencing God, and I had no one to share that with. And Dorothy Day was like, my companion on this journey. And so it, it both revealed to me some of the limitations of my own Christian theology when it came to 
what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus right here in these, you know, unequal and unjust systems? Mm. And so Dorothy Day has sort of been like a companion for me. Um, her autobiography, I really, I really encourage people to read it, The Long Loneliness, but the title kind of gives it away. It's not exactly a hundred percent happy story, <laughs> but it's a, it's a beautiful story of, of what it means when we, we do move into these spaces of mutuality. I was also thinking about this theme of hospitality and really hospitality. I think Dorothy was amazing at pointing out that hierarchy is often the antithesis of hospitality. And so what does it mean to put ourselves into a position where we need help? We need hospitality ourselves in order to make it through the day. And that's something I want to continue mm. to, to strive for in my own life every day. Yeah. You know, when I was growing up here in the South, uh, uh, the the symbol of hospitality was the pineapple. People would put a little pineapple door knocker on their door. Uh, that's supposed to mean you were hospitable. Uh, <laughs> that goes all the way back to you know when pineapples were uh, this uh, you know oddity that only rich people could get if they lived close to the port. You know where the ship came in, you could get a pineapple and you would serve the pineapple. You know when you had honored special guests. So this 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 notion of like you know hospitality as as, as the sharing of our largesse with other people um, is, is very rooted in the kind of, you know, Southern niceness that I grew up with. And you, uh, you recognize uh, Dorothy Day and the Catholic worker as embodying a very different hospitality, what you're pointing to here. I mean, this sort of invitation into mm -hmm. genuine fellowship with one another mm -hmm. as, a, as a way of being invited into the life of God. I know you've been digging into the early days of the worker in writing your book, what are you what are you finding there in terms of uh, uh, Dorothy's insight, Peter Marin's insight, the experience that they were having? What what can we learn for today from those early days of the worker? Yeah, so I, I am working on a book, and it, I'm not a biographer, and I'm not a historian. I'm just someone who has really been drawn to Dorothy's story, like I already mentioned. So I, I just think some of the parallels to when Dorothy started the Catholic Worker, her newspaper. Um, basically, she was like, we need a paper of faith for the unemployed, like we need Catholic social thought and teaching to be out in the world during the Great Depression, when there's these huge, you know, amounts of people who are struggling to have their basic needs met. And honestly, the parallels to right now are pretty, um, mm. I don't know, almost eerie, like, I do think the long term effects of COVID-19 are going to be uh, far reaching as far as people in poverty, people needing their basic needs met. And I know there's a lot of people like myself who are like, okay, what does our Christian faith have to say about these issues? Hmm. What can we do today to help reduce suffering in our neighborhoods? And, you know, Dorothy was pretty awesome at saying like, charity is an awful word. Like people don't want charity. They want justice, right? What do we want? We want even some of the scriptures we were reading this morning, it points to a world where everybody is flourishing and thriving and uh, who are the best people to help us move forward in that? Those are the people who have experienced the oppression and the marginalization. So those are two things I love about Dorothy, right? She didn't think she had the answers, yeah. but she said, you know, together we're going to work towards a world. The thing that continues to be so challenging to me about Dorothy and, you know, Peter Moore and all these people is they really were like, if you want to experience the miraculous work of God, you have to put yourself in a position of need. That's something that's really hard for me as like a middle class white American is to put myself in a position where I need my neighbors and I need their help to think about how to move forward. So that's, I don't know, that's something I'm still working with and struggling with. Like, what is God calling me to, you know, tomorrow just to, instead of making sure my life is safe and secure, all my bills are paid. What, what can I move into to, to have to actually depend on God and depend on my neighbors? Yeah, that's good. Uh, that's so good. Um, you know, Robert, as, as I'm hearing Danielle, I'm thinking you, you've, you've, you know, compiled some of the, uh, the, the, the real iconic books on Dorothy. I, I had one of them on my, uh, in my room when my house burnt down 10 years ago and I ran in to grab it. <laughs> and I actually, I got the, um, that the picture you're talking about, we've got framed yeah. with Dorothy with all the cops around her, you know, and at the, at the bottom of it, it says our problems stem from our acceptance of this filthy rotten system, you know? And so that's got, it's got char marks all over it from the fire. So I kind of <laughs> love that. And, um, but, you know, I, I carried that book of Do Dorothy's selected writings around with me everywhere. Um, and, mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the things that she says are so relevant, as Danielle's saying, what, what are just a few, couple of nuggets that you feel like 
we are still really drawn to because you know even obama called dorothy one of the great dorothy day one of the uh great mm -hmm. examples of historic americans you know um and she had she had so many ideas that feel like they could have been written today mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, yeah, what, what Dale was saying uh, raised a lot of really interesting questions for me. In fact, the new issue, the 88th anniversary issue of the Catholic Worker for May Day has a cover story that I just uh, published today uh, where I talked about sort of three ingredients that I think are distinctive about the Catholic Worker. Uh, I, I say like the metaphor of like the ingredients of Catholic Worker soup, you know, not the DNA with the soup. Gotta have the, the soup. soup. That's right. <laughs> there's literal <laughs> soup there. There's soup metaphor. Line metaphorical soup, you know, and uh, the first would be that kind of uh, idea of recognizing Christ in the poor, uh, you know, the Matthew 25 kind of idea, I was hungry and you fed me and that, and that's kind of the foundation of the hospitality and the works of mercy and all of that. But then what she did, you know, a lot of religious orders do the same kind of thing, uh, works of mercy, but then she adds this other element, which is of confronting and protesting against the structures and, the, and society that create so much uh, you know, poverty and need. And that's that connection that Dale's making between you know, the combination of charity and justice. She didn't like have to choose between them. Uh, but then there's actually a third element that I think that Peter Morin brought into the mix, into the recipe uh, from the beginning. And that was that it's not just enough to protest against all the things that you're against, but you have to, to kind of embody and point toward what you're for, some alternative vision. And that was, I think you put those three things together. That for Dorothy is why she, you know, the, the farm workers appealed to her hmm. uh, or other, you know, movements like that, that are kind of embodying or pointing the way toward a different set of values. And I think that's where the real critical thing we come to today, because a lot of people will go out on the street and, and, and protest. Uh, but what is the, what is the alternative kind of society that we want to have? What are the kind of values that we want to see of, of community mm. versus individualism, of solidarity rather than than selfishness, of kind of generosity rather than you know hoarding our, our property or our security, whether national or personal, you know. And I think that that I, I also like to kind of point something that Deal said, pointing me in the direction of a kind of a, an understanding of hospitality is not just like opening your door and saying you know y'all are welcome or here's my pineapple, I'm going to share it with you or something like that. But this kind of, and I think it points to that radical idea that Jesus points to that kind of breaks open the whole idea of, of us and them, you know, mm. uh, that, you know, and it becomes, you know, a, 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 an inclusive community. Uh, so when, when they take ra hospitality to its radical direction, it's not like, okay, I'm, I'm going to share a little bit of what I got with you. But like, we're all, we're all members of the same family, you know, we're mm. all members of one body. And I think that Dorothy, you know, that's a very traditional kind of Christian idea, but she applied that in its kind of radical social dimension. Mm. Yeah. You know, that it makes me think about um, Howard Thurman said that um, we have hatred in the human family because we have a lot of encounter without fellowship. Mm. You know, he, I mean, he, this is a man who grew up in the South in a black skin and understood that, you know, people had been in proximity to one another, but hadn't actually known one another. Yeah. And there's a possibility of, of, uh, of, mm -hmm. of lacking that fellowship. I, I wonder what y'all have seen from your own experience and from uh, the witness of uh, the worker uh, that makes that fellowship possible. What, what, what makes it possible to kind of break down those barriers in actual practice? Uh, does that happen for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd say, you know, my uh, experience at the Catholic Worker was of a, of a kind of a striving toward a sort of an open community. Obviously, you, there's not room for everybody, uh, but in so, but a kind of spirit of, of, of welcome. And the interesting thing about, again, this, this idea of hospitality is it's not based on like whether you are, you know, worthy of our hospitality, <laughs> uh, but you know, it it was an openness to to people as they come, uh, with all of their flaws, with all of their addictions, with all of their mental problems, with all of their desperation and need, you know, and so it was not a community that was built around, 
you know, like some screening process here, you had to go through an intake, you know, interview or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that it would work, the fact that, that it, you know, that the people could uh, form some kind of community, not on the basis of some ideal that, you know, that we on some level are, are, are all, you know, human beings, but on, on, you know, as Thomas Merton kind of said, recognizing a, a, a unity that already exists mm -hmm. and building on that. And, uh, and, and, that, and it was a very radical kind of alternative to our, our sort of protective gated community sort of idea that we have in this country. Mm -hmm. Hey, I got, I got a question I wanted to throw out. Now, John, and I, I'm interested in your thought on this. And then DL, you, you should uh, chime in too. Is, so Dorothy had this idea of personalism, right? That we are personally responsible for loving our neighbor as ourself. And she used to say, you know, if every Christian would just make room for the stranger, we would end homelessness overnight, right? Like that this idea that personally loving our neighbor. Um, but then, um, you know, there's a lot of anarchists that love that piece of Dorothy Day that wouldn't be as excited about the, the voting and things like that, Jonathan. So I, I wonder how you, you know, even when we think of welcoming the stranger and hospitality, like it's great for us to show love and mercy to someone we meet on the streets or a refugee in, in our neighborhood. But we, we're also fighting for some of this systemic change. You know, we, we want our, our government to be have policies that are more hospitable to refugees and things. So how do you how do you uh, uh, dance with those, Jonathan and, and others of us like uh, they're not exclusive, obviously. I think some of us have a heavier foot on one or the other, but they're, they go together a little bit. But Dorothy, I mean, she comes across pretty anarchistic there. You know, she. She got the she got the sisters. I love the, the, pers sisters I love the, the personalism, the but you know, uh, person to, to take a personal responsibility for the well-being of uh, everyone in a society, in a democratic society, is to take a personal responsibility not only to get down there and cast your ballot, but to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to cast their ballot, which is quite a struggle these days. Quite a struggle mm -hmm. indeed. No, I I think it is a way to be personally responsible uh, to not to not let the state be this thing that exists out there, but rather to be personally engaged with it and recognize that we all have to take a degree of responsibility. But I know this is something that we all have wrestled with. Yes, it is. What, what, what do y'all make of this question of personalism and the, and the issues of uh, structural and systemic justice that we're facing? If I, if I can just say one thing, it's just that for me, Dorothy and her, and like anarchist leanings. And that's something that's been really important for me as I study her is just leftist, communist, social, all these people really helped move her towards viewing systemic injustice. And it's not something she disavowed like when she converted to Catholicism, but she viewed it all as a part of God's work in her life. For someone like me who grew up where, you know, to be socialist was the worst thing in the world <laughs> or anarchist. Like it's been really interesting to delve into Dorothy's life and allow it to trouble me. I don't think you should read about these people we admire and just take everything, but but what troubles you? I think it's good to stay and think about that. Um, I've continued to be sort of pushed in certain directions to think how I, I view about things. Um, I think it is really interesting that Dorothy chose to never vote. That's not how I feel called in my personal, you know, context to do but also you have to do more I, I agree with jonathan you have to make sure your neighbors have access to their to their voice being heard by the people who have power so for me i just say don't don't try to write off those parts of dorothy's story but really lean into them and and uh you know this past summer going to some protests here in portland i was just struck by some of these communities that you know people who call themselves anarchists people who call themselves uh, you know, definitely not religious. They are out there helping each other, feeding each other, giving water, taking care of each other, being medics. It was really inspiring. And I know Dorothy also found that inspiring. When she saw people doing the work of Christ in the world, she just, she took it as a gift, you know, and, and I just want to continue to do that in my own life. Hmm. Yeah, Ro Robert, uh, feel free to respond to any of this, but also, you know, even with her anarchistic uh, si uh, part, the, that part of her, she was um, strikingly um, traditional in a lot of ways. I mean, she was a really devout Catholic, even as she was a reformer of stuff, so, or, or even a revolutionary. So uh, how do you um, see those pieces of her in, in her interacting, you know, to where she's, she's really, I mean, because I think of her, you know, today, I think she would be on the front lines of the 
uh, voter suppression stuff, you know, and the discrimination against black folks and probably also be like, uh, you know, this policing system. Uh, I mean, there's some things you reform and there's some things that the whole trees, we got to rethink this whole system. So anyway, uh, you know, as you, as you look at those parts of her, it's a beautiful cocktail of revolution and tradition that she embraces. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, she, of course, you know, comes out of, or at least a Catholic worker in the time of the Depression and the, the New Deal. Uh, and uh, there was, you know, the kind of sense that, well, the government will take care of all these problems. Uh, and so what's really important is who's elected president. Well, there's something uh, to that. But she felt that that front, you know, speaking to basically a Christian audience, uh, that idea of the thinking that concern or care for our, our brothers and sisters is the government's job uh, represented a kind of defection of Christian responsibility, where we focus just in on ourselves and our, our salvation, our own souls or whatever, and not about taking care of, you know, of, of our neighbor. Uh, and so, uh, so I, I guess she was trying to point in that direction. A lot of the things about Dorothy Day uh, you know, if you if you take it in a kind of fundamentalist way, well, Dorothy never voted, or Dorothy never did this, or something like that. Uh, I don't think she, you know, I don't think that's the kind of model that she she represents. But I think she she does uh, point us in the direction of, as you say, of a kind of taking personal responsibility. And politics is not just something that you practice uh, once every four years in the ballot, you know, booth or something like that. It's something you practice uh, every day, and we. We we see what a difference it it, it makes to have you know corrupt and incompetent uh, you know government uh, uh, and 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 government that that is uh, you know oriented toward the common good uh, but and I think she would you know applaud those kinds of of, of gestures without thinking that okay therefore uh, that's not our job anymore we don't have to worry about those things mm -hmm. so uh, her kind of politics was I mean here's somebody who was. Who was using, you know, like Thoreau would say, casting her whole vote uh, around issues of peace and labor mm. and social justice and good. community and things like that, uh, and not just uh, focusing on, you know, identification with a political party or something like that. Mm. Mm. Well, you know, like Dorothy, both of you are writers, and uh, I was uh, <laughs> I actually read read your article this morning, uh, Robert. And I was thinking about how that that vision of sort of uh, creating a new order within the shell of the old was part, you know, local experiment for Dorothy, but it was also part like paying attention to always what was happening. And that was a lot of what the worker did. Like it, it lifted up the stories of the, you know, labor struggles, the farm workers movement, the anti-war movements. And, um, you know, she went down to Koinonia farm and sat vigil and got shot at and all that stuff. So, um, I, I wondered for for y'all, like what 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 role does that have in terms of this sort of broad sense of fellowship uh, with our fellow um, folks in the human community and in the body of Christ? Uh, that that role of sort of connecting with other movements and things that uh, are happening toward this uh, this vision. I'll jump in if it's your address Please, my article. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I thought that, um, you know, obviously the Catholic worker and the soup line where you, you or bread line where you feed a hundred or a couple hundred people a day, that doesn't take care of the problem of poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, inviting a few people into a house of hospitality, that does not solve the problem of, of homelessness. Mm -hmm. uh, so on one hand, the Catholic worker was trying to, to be almost a kind of symbolic you know, or prophetic uh, finger pointing in the direction of what it would look like if we lived by different values. Not if, okay, well, the Catholic worker will take care of all of that. You know, there's a homeless person that you call up the Catholic worker and say, uh, there's a homeless person down on the corner of Fourth and Walnut or something. You should, you should know about that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, she was trying to kind of uh, awaken people's conscience, mm -hmm. you know, to enlarge their idea of, of what it meant to be, to be faithful. Now, on these other things, too, the Catholic worker, you know, a few people sitting out in Central Park or something protesting a civil defense drill, that doesn't end uh, nuclear, you know, testing or something like that. Uh, but the example of the witness of individuals who are, who are willing to go to jail, uh, you know, uh, for the sake of peace and, and to, to follow their conscience, that that has a contagious effect that could affect yeah. other people. Yeah. So 
you know, the she didn't say like everybody's got to come to the Catholic worker. The Catholic worker is going to solve all the problems of the world. Um, but and so why, if you read the Catholic worker, you know, Dorothy's writings, always so much attention that she was calling to allied, you know, movements and communities, and it could be people working on the land or on labor issues or civil rights issues or peace issues or hospitality and the works of mercy. Uh, and she didn't ever say, well, you know, you've got that little piece of it. You know, Cesar Chavez, you, you're pretty good on that labor stuff, but what are you doing about nuclear weapons or something? Mother Teresa, you're pretty good taking care of, of poor dying people, but how come you're not, you know, dealing with the structures and all of that? She, mm -hmm. she welcomed you know, wherever people plugged into that uh, kind of picture mm -hmm. and tried, you know, to, in the Catholic worker in her own life, to kind of hold it all, all, all together. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, it's not a matter of all being the Catholic worker, but of recognizing, you know, our community with all kinds of other people and affirming them. And I know, Jonathan, I know, Shane, you, you're really involved in this kind of stuff with the death penalty or civil rights or voting rights or whatever, of holding it, you know, all together, that it's all part of the big picture. Ooh, mm. yeah, that's right. Oh, I'm, I, I, even as you're talking, you know, I, I think this, this edge of being able to cook a huge meal and invite <laughs> anybody to the table and then get in the streets and, you know, protest the conditions that lead to this massive inequity of the world we live in. I mean, that's that's Dorothy Day, right? I think even right now, uh, her granddaughter Martha Hennessy is in jail, right, for a, um, a, you know a prophetic action of trying to dismantle our uh, arsenal of weapons. And uh, by the way, word on the streets is the, the Kings Bay plowshares used some. Uh, uh, tools that were made uh, from guns. I can neither confirm nor deny well, that. But, uh, <laughs> but they're in jail. You know, this is Dorothy's yeah. granddaughter. So uh, that that tradition, Danielle, as you think of like what that means for us right now to, to both practice the hospitality and the mercy and the compassion, because there's people that are um, anarchists that are in the streets that are doing that protesting, but it's been a while since they sat down with someone in prison or had a meal or you know immigration i think that's at least true of my story is you can you can kind of get in the streets and forget the the mercy and hospitality but likewise you can run a soup kitchen and forget to address why people are hungry to begin with so uh as you're you're putting that work together in your book uh how else do you do you see some of those those pieces for us today because it seems like we we got to hold those together like side the scissors right <laughs> yeah, I love I just love Dorothy as a writer. I do think we like to think of her in these iconic images of protesting as an older person, you know, not smiling in the pictures, severe, but she was a really complicated, complex person. And, you know, she really wanted to be a writer from day one. And she was really influenced by, you know, these muckraking journalists who who wanted to change the world with their writing. And I think that's important to remember. And I think when she met Peter Morin, it was after she had converted to Catholicism for a few years and she was kind of struggling, like, how do I put all of my like sort of radical social order changing leanings into my new faith? And she was really mm. struggling. And Peter Morin came and was like, let me tell you about these historic Christians of the Catholic Church. There is these teachings, like the works of mercy, right, can be both very personal and they can be structural. You, you like, And I think God allows us to play with how are we going to implement some of these things in our life. And so for me, it's been such a fun, I say fun, but it's also hard, as we all know, to always be considering how are we supposed to be living out these things? Like I read the works of mercy, right? Give someone a cup of cold water, clothe them, visit them in prison. And, and sometimes I'll just be like, yeah, I don't have any connections to people in prison right now. How is God asking me to be more involved in the lives of incarcerated folks? But I think Dorothy, you know, it, I want everybody to go back and just read the first issue of the Catholic Worker she put out. You know, she's a 35 year old single mom in the midst of the Great Depression in New York. And she just like exudes this eight page paper on all these really intense issues of the day. Things like the US government, you know, exploiting black American workers, uh, child labor laws, women in industry being exploited. Like, and it just all poured out of her. But the cutest thing to me, maybe I shouldn't say cute. There's this little thing at the very front that just says, do something. She's telling like the Christian yeah. Catholics really. She's like, read this and then do something. And that is just, this is, I think about that all the time. This, and Dorothy never really lost that. She was excited though. I think in the beginning, especially and throughout her life, there's just such an excitement to say, you know what? This God we serve, 
his dream for the world is so big and so beautiful. Like we get to do something mm. about all of this, you know, all of this poverty, all of this injustice going on, we get to do something. And, and I just want to keep that excitement with me as, as sometimes we can all get overwhelmed with mm. the cares of the world. Mm. It's good. I, you know, thank you, Danielle. I think that, that the other thing that you brought to my attention and Robert, I think you, you might, you might want to say a word on this, but it is, she's real honest in her writing. I mean, she wrote a book called The Long Loneliness. <laughs> and one of the things that we've been saying is that, that an onlooking world is not looking for Christians that are perfect, but they're looking for Christians that are honest, honest with their doubts, honest with their struggles. I mean, Dorothy Day was very honest about having an abortion. Um, she smoked, uh, you know, one of her most famous lines was, uh, don't call us saints. We don't want to be dismissed that easily. <laughs> you know. So I, I think that all those things, you know, that are a part of who she is. And yet it's, it's, you know, as John across said, it's the cracks that let the light come in. It's a part of what I think people are drawn to a Dorothy was that she uh, does look more like all of us. She wasn't perfect. And was pretty mm. honest about that but uh don't you think that's true of her writing robert and her life is that you see this person that's sort of a work in progress and so there's folks that are also a work in progress that can vibe with that i think that um she always you know wanted to have a kind of personal voice and and daniel mentioned that you know her the influence of muckraking journalists but you also have to look at, at the influence of writers like dostoevsky and she, you know, I don't know, she was not a Dostoevsky, but she, she wanted to write about uh, people that would, you know, in a way that would touch your heart and would make you think, like, yeah, they're 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 human beings. They they suffer the same way that I do. They have the same uh, yearnings, the same desires, the same hopes. Uh, they may uh, look very different than me. They may be wearing shabby clothes or homeless, uh, but that's another human being. Uh, and make them come, to, you know, and, and that is to say they're a temple of the Holy Ghost. That means they, they bear the image of Christ. Uh, and uh, she didn't want, you know, her, herself to be put on a pedestal uh, the way we, we do with saints. That's not the way she looked at saints. But when we think of a saint as kind of some perfect person who never has doubts, uh, never makes a mistake, uh, never loses their temper, never, you know, makes the wrong decision. That was not at all her reading of the saints. Uh, you know, beginning with St. Peter uh, and all the ragtag, you know, fishermen who fall around Jesus. Uh, and it was, it was true of herself and the Catholic worker. And so she never wanted to romanticize that so that like people would come down to the Catholic worker and said, well, I, I thought this, you're, you're not at all the way I thought you'd be. You're just like ordinary people. She, she put it all out there and never tried to, you know, any kind of deceptive advertising uh, that we're all so great, you know, perfect people down here at the Catholic work come and mm. come and worship us <laughs> yeah well wow what a what a beautiful conversation I don't know if you have any closing words you should at least each of you tell uh, 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 how people can get your book and how people can follow <laughs> your work on social media uh, and any any other closing hospitality Dorothy Day wisdom for us yeah yeah, Dio, you start us. Okay, well, I'm I'm currently finishing writing a book on Dorothy Day. Again, just so, sort of from my personal experience, that'll be coming out a year from today, May Day, 2022. So keep May Day on in your minds and uh, we'll celebrate Dorothy then. But I will say personally, I've been so impacted by both Shane and Jonathan talking about Dorothy. And um, of course, Robert Ellsberg is, has put out so much of Dorothy's work. And I wanna just put a plug for uh, Dorothy Day's Diaries, which Robert edited, and it's been such mm -hmm. an incredible companion uh, for me. Thank you. Uh, I, I, yeah, I've, I've just finished my fourth book of Dorothy Day's writings coming out uh, next week. Uh, it's her writings from the 1960s, and I think you'll really like that. Uh, be, it's on pilgrimage the 60s from Orbis Books because it it really is a, a great uh, picture of how she of how her very traditional kind of Catholic faith was really uh, applied and engaged with the, the issues of, of this very turbulent decade. And I'm working on, on it for next spring, a, a collection of her writings from the 70s, which is a little closer mm -hmm. to my, my, my time. But yes, all uh, follow me on, on Twitter at Robert Ellsbury, uh, where I write a lot about Dorothy Day and Saints. And thank you, uh, Jonathan and Shane, you, you inspire me so much. Uh, you're, you, are, you are so much in, 
you know, in, in walking in her, uh, her path, then she would love you. Uh, what a so blessing good. to be together today. Let's, uh, let's join our voices in the prayer that the Lord taught us. Our Father, Father which art in Father heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God, help us to imitate you as we feed those who hunger for bread, for justice, for companionship, for forgiveness, for alternate ways of living in this world. Give us your words, equip our hands, and guide our feet. Sustain us, Lord, with your healing love. Amen. Amen. Before our benediction, you got any announcements, Shane? Well, just real quick, this has uh, been just a lovely conversation. I hope y'all have enjoyed it, and uh, it's recorded so you can pass on the word to other people. Well, there's things we didn't even explore. We're going to have to do this again, like the urban-rural partnership, the agro-university. I mean, we didn't even get into all that, but Jonathan, as I, I we were closing, I, I just got this um, statue who, it reminds me of the work of Dorothy and the Catholic worker, and even the, the etchings of Fritz Eichenberg, and if you've seen any of those, but it's a, uh, often called the homeless Jesus. It's a, a person on a park bench with the nail marks in their feet that you can see, and, um, uh, you know, as, as we think of this, this uh, conversation this morning, as Dorothy said, the uh, the, the only real atheist is the one who can't see the image of God in the poor and another person. And when we, whatever we're doing to the most vulnerable, we're doing to Jesus. So uh, I saw that, I just got this yesterday and it made me think of that, but let's uh, go forth with that, that spirit of trying to find Jesus in his many distressing disguises in the world around us. And uh, there's a few opportunities on the horizon here at Red Letter Christians to keep digging a little deeper into this stuff. One of them is um, we're going to start a book club tomorrow, actually. Tony Campolo and I are going to team up, and we got this book we did, uh, Red Letter Revolution. We're going to do four weeks of talking through it with uh, people. So you can register now. We've got limited space, but jump on, register, and join us for, even if you can just make one week, we're going to do it for four Sundays here in May, starting tomorrow. So uh, that's happening. Jonathan's helping organize a faith forum on uh, the battle for the ballot. And won't you say a word about that? May 10th in the evening. We've been doing these faith forums every month on a different major pressing issue like immigration, the death penalty, gun violence. And this month, Jonathan's helping do it on voting rights. We already talked a little bit about voting rights. Uh, yeah, this is a chance to hear from Bishop William Barber, who has been leading uh, in the moral struggle for voting rights. And he'll be in conversation with uh, one of the leading lawyers working on this, who, who actually credits Bishop Barber for inspiring him to do this work, Mark Elias, who challenged the big lie last year. This year, he's challenging these voter suppression attempts in state court and is going to give us an update on exactly what's happening in those cases. Yeah, so put that on your calendar, May 10th, 8 o'clock. Uh, it's Pentecost this month. Woo, woo, birthday of the church. So we're going to have a Pentecost party on the 23rd. Uh, Katie's over here. Uh, and I, I think we might get even get our Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit fell in fire. So we might get some fire out and a uh, uh, fire breathe and something like that. But we're also going to worship the sweet Lord Jesus and celebrate the birthday of the church. So May 23rd, seven o'clock. Um, and then every month we've been doing a book club. So y'all might have joined Jonathan and I. We did uh, Anthea Butler's wonderful book, White Evangelical Racism, this month. And next month, this is the official announcement. Uh, making the making of biblical womanhood by Beth Barr. She's going to join us at the end of the month. So grab this book if you can, and uh, start reading it with me and uh, John, other others of us at RLC, and uh, we'll have Beth with us at the end of the month. So that's it. What a great morning of prayer and action. Uh, we do all this. We just try to do it because we we love praying and talking with each other. Um, you can keep supporting us if you 
are able to just go to redletterchristians.org and donate because we sure like giving uh, Robert and DL a, a little, just a little something to say we love you and we want to support your work. So donate if you can, but um, that's it. Now we get to sing out. John's going to send, send us out in this wonderful this, song. This blessing from our friends at the Northumbria community. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. Amen.